Today we have Bartosz Skwarczyk, who is uh, the founder and president of uh, G G2A Capital Group. He's an entrepreneur with over 20 years experience and he's a coach, a mentor and a public speaker. He's the founder and president of the uh, supervisory board of G2A Capital Group, to which belongs G2A.com. It's the largest and most dynamically developed global marketplace for digital entertainment, where users can buy vouchers for digital products such as games, gifts, subscriptions, and, and software. The marketplace already has over 25 million users from 180 countries. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Bartes. Thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on my show. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much, Mark, for having me. It's a pleasure and thanks for such a good pronunciation of my name. I know it's very, very easy. It about. is unusual, but I, I definitely <laughs> tried. I put it phonetically so I could get thank it as you. close as I could. So, yeah, I no, thank that. you. Thank you, Bartos. Thank you so much. So the first question I ask all of my guests is, what does a business mindset mean to you? It's an amazing question because there is so many answers. When I think business mindset, I think about a few areas. One, vision. So what do you really want to create? Because entrepreneurs are creators. And vision, goal, where you want to head up is the first area. The second one is people. Because there is no big business without people. And I believe that human being, people, is the most important ingredient of any business in the world. And the third one would be, of course, finance and numbers and KPIs and everything you have there. But there is very important also personal side. How much you, as an entrepreneur, how you can navigate this very challenging environment, which is being the CEO, the founder, the president, in general, being on the top of the game. So business mindset would be the puzzle of those ingredients. I would 100% agree with that. I want to touch on the people side, because one of the things that I think is absolutely fascinating about business is Everything is based on people, whether it's people as in your clients or whether it's people as your employees or, or your boards that you're working with. Often KPIs and numbers and finances, revenues and profitability is very critical, absolutely very important for business. But sometimes the people get forgotten and it, it wrapped up in a KPI that you need to attain. What for you has been your biggest um your biggest success when it comes to people. Let's talk about your employees, first of all. Tell me about uh, how you've been able to create such a great team around you uh, for your company. People is probably the biggest factor of G2A success. And there are different type of leaders. There are different type of managers. And what we cultivate and we've been doing that for almost 15 years in G2A, is human approach, people approach. So from the very first day, I was focused on values, on creating the framework of who we want to be, not only as a business, because that is defined by vision, mission, strategy, etc., but by people, by human beings. And those values, at the end of the day, they create your company. So we can go back to Peter Drucker saying culture is a strategy for breakfast. And that would be all about people and what kind of culture they create. And my biggest success answering your question is that over half of the employees of G2A are longer than five years with the business. I have tremendous, amazing people on board, very skillful, very loyal, very honest, very rooted with our DNA, with our values. At the same time, half of the people came to G2A after COVID or during the pandemic time 
which created a very special environment because we had to find the common way of thinking about the business when on one side you have past business models with the with the offices, physical offices, everybody's going to the office, mm. and the new normal where we have a home office. So I think that creating the team around G2A, which is very responsible, which is very skillful and ambitious, and based on a couple of super important values for us, this is my great success. And, and we'll come back to people again, because I think I, I really do believe it's the most critical aspect of business. And you need to track things, you have to monitor things, you have to look at the numbers. But I, I really feel that within every business you're embedded and your success is based on the people that you have. But we'll come back to that later on. Tell me one thing about your upbringing, which reflects on who you are today. About my up upbringing, how you're brought up. I was born in quite small city, New Sonch, not New York. You cannot mistake them. <laughs> and <laughs> in very decent family, but also not very rich. My parents, they tried to give me everything they could, of course. I have fantastic brother, four years younger than myself. And our childhood had, in my opinion, all ingredients that are important. On the one hand, happiness, very good parents trying to give you whatever they can. At the same time, challenges, because challenges create character. And without them, you cannot build the strong character. And during our childhood and then in the primary school, secondary, high school, etc. There were many of them. And I think this mix was super important for me. My father was an entrepreneur and I could observe his ups and downs. He was on the top of the game and he was on the very bottom of the game. And I could observe his at home and in the office. And I would see incredible examples of how good was his approach to people. Probably this is one of the cornerstones I brought from my family home because he was on one hand very respectful to them and on the other very friendly and, and very generous. And my mother, she taught me that whatever you do it either in the best way you can or stop doing it. And I think this was a, a secret sauce of who I am today. So I can say I was blessed with childhood and the first time of first part of my life was the key to, to who I am today and where I am. Do you think your father being an entrepreneur was a direct correlation between before when you kept, got to the age of working and starting businesses? Do you think he was the main factor that you wanted to be entrepreneurial? Yes, because very early I started working. I was in my high school when I was earning money. I was tennis trainer. I was stringing the rackets. I was even cleaning the cars of my neighbors just to earn $2 per car. And, and in my high school, I already knew that I want to be the CEO of the business, the founder of the business. So very early, I knew that this is the direction for me. I had one moment when I had to decide whether I want to be a professional tennis player or I want to be a business person. And I decided that being a professional tennis player will be too risky because when you got injured, it's end of the story. And I decided that business life is something that is more appealing for me. Do you think that, does that tell me a bit about your risk appetite? Because would you, how, what is your risk appetite now? Would you, and, and has it changed over the years? Not really. My risk appetite is a big one. One of the key factors that I always check when hiring someone, when inviting someone to G2A 
is the appetite for life, for achievements, for growth, for work, and also for risk. And for risk, your appetite must be balanced. So it cannot be too far because otherwise the business wouldn't be there for 15 years, but it cannot be too small because in the entrepreneurial life, especially when you are the CEO and I've been CEO, I was CEO for 20 years. Just earlier this year, I became the chairman, the president, but before for 20 years, when he, I was the CEO and this is the case of every CEO I met, you have to make decisions not having all the data. So at the end of the day, the most difficult cases landed at your desk. And when people don't know what to do with something, they come to you. And you have to be the one to either say your call, your decision, or if they don't know, you have to make a choice. It is easy when you have 100% of data, but it is never the case. Most often you have 80%, 70, 50, 20, and then your risk appetite is important. And again, it must be balanced. If it's too small, your business will never be big because there are several instances when you have to say, yes, let's go, let's do it. And that is related very directly with the risk appetite. Yeah, and I, I heard something on social media recently by Jeff Bezos of Amazon. And he said, as a president, chairman, CEO, one more CEO, as a CEO of a large company, startups are different. Startups, you're just all pitching in. Whoever's in your team, they're all pulling in the same direction to grow as quickly as possible. But as a CEO of a large company, it's all about making quality decisions and that's your role. It's not necessarily to have, as you say, not necessarily have all the data to make a like a qualified decision, but making quality decisions as a CEO is important. What's your view on that? Fully agree. Warren Buffett said that he does three to five decisions per year. That's it important, the biggest ones, and that's enough. Of course, he meant probably the investment decisions yes. on the biggest, on the biggest investments they do, but at the same time, the quality decisions probably is the most important thing. So as a CEO, you have to find the time to, to think, to consider the decisions that are in front of you. And this is a challenge because I give you my example. At the beginning of every day, I start the day with the list of things to do. Either this is beginning of the day or the end of the last day when you are planning the next one. And we will not do everything. And when I ask my mentor at MIT, Bob Posen, really smart guy who is leading the, the, the part of the MIT, which is dedicated to productivity. And I asked him and said, Hey, Bob, tell me how to deal with this. I have so many things to do. I have limited time, limited resources, but always there is more thing to do. And he said, Bartosz, don't worry. Each of us has exactly the same setup and make a list, ABC, watch out. It's MIT. A, B, C, and A are the things that must be done today. B must be done this week. C, probably you will never get there. And That's, that's great, Bartos, because uh, <laughs> my, my mentor did exactly the same thing. He said three <laughs> groups of, of things you need to do. Choose three things you have to do, to have to do today. Second group is what you'd like to do today. And the third group is something that you three things that you're probably not going to do but you need to keep it in your mind it's it's an incredible yeah. way to be able to structure your day and and um i wholeheartedly agree with that it it seems to be simplification yeah you you hear that and you're saying no come on it cannot be like like mit saying this though no. yeah but at the end of the day yes this 
it works basically yeah. because there is amazing phrase which i love keep the first thing first thing keep the first thing it is easy to be defocused both mm. as a person as a leader as a manager and as a business especially when the business is successful you think you are unbeatable. You think, oh, we can do this, we can do that. Let's think about it. Let's think about something else. And then, and it is a huge trap because you can distract the business. So very important thing is to be focused, laser focused on mm. what you really want to achieve and do. And I can give you an example of G2A. So what we had in this Hard to say, the focus or doing the next stage and the next stage. Do you want me, Mark, to, to, to give an example? Yes, of course. Two years ago, we hired Bain Company. Amazing advisor. They are next to McKinsey and yeah, um, yeah. No, no, and, no. and BCG. And we told them, hey, let's work on our strategy. And they look at what we did. We did eight or 12 weeks workshop. Great job. And at the same time, they told us, hey, you have two parts of the business. One of them is digital and one of them is physical. Our idea at that time was let's do everything for the gamer. If, if the gamer plays the game, they would also like to buy a mouse, a keyboard, a gaming chair, etc. Mm -hmm. And Bain came to us saying, hey, in digital space, you are top three in the world. But in physical, you have no rights to win. How do you want to compete with the logistics of Amazon? How do you mm. want to compete with the prices of the biggest companies in the world where they have billions of dollars of budgets, etc.? And they told us, you have to close it. You have to close the physical part of the business and be focused only on digital. And we did it very quickly. We did it within three weeks because when we had the strategy and we agreed on it because we were co-creators of it. Mm -hmm. And all right, now execution part. And after that, the consultant, they came to us and they told us, hey, you know what? We did 6,000 projects with our clients, the biggest companies in the world. And maybe a handful of companies, when they've got the strategy, Within two, three weeks, they start literally executed go. And you are one of them. It is amazing. And it this is, amazing. is what we call focus. When yeah. we have the focus, let's go for it and let's do it. And in my opinion, this is super important for CEOs, for entrepreneurs, also for managers to be focused and to really know where you are heading, what you want to achieve. And how you want to measure that? So we've been 20 minutes into this interview. I've not really told the audience apart from the intro about G2A. So it's a digital marketplace. And when I was looking at your website, you uh, currently you do gaming, software, uh, like uh, subscriptions and gifts and things like that. How did it actually all start? And, and what was the growth trajectory for your company all the way back to the start? It is... Two years ago, I was in Silicon Valley and I talked to the biggest private equity funds, which are there in New York, in uh, San Francisco, in London, in Boston. And they asked me this question, how it all started, where you are, who is your investor, what do you do? And my answer was, yes, G2A is the largest marketplace for digital goods in the world with 30 million clients, with almost... With, 200 countries where we have our clients with dozens of thousands of sellers, etc. At the same time, we are bootstrap business. And they said, what? I said, bootstrap, we never had any investor. They said, no, it's impossible. This is not the business model we know. The business model we know is you start small, then you go immediately for the first angel financing, then the seed round, then A, B, C, D, E, F. Yep. And after a couple of years, the founder is with the stake 5% of the business and tons of investors on board. 
And I told them, sorry, we have a different point of view in our part of the world, maybe because the financial market was not so developed when we were starting. But mm. at the end of the day, it all started very humble. It all started with me, my business partner, and four employees, and one small room, 13 square meters. And we were working there. And we were online store, buying and selling games. It all started with games. And that was the time when 30% of the business, gaming business was digital, 70% was physical. Today, the proportion is totally yeah. upside down. It's 95% digital. Yeah. But at that time, the growth trajectory was fast for us. Why? Few things. One, we were focused on, not only on the client is obvious. Every company is saying we are obsessed about clients. Yeah, of course. We all are. We all are. At the same time, we were all gamers and we really understood the client very well. So we really understood what is the need of the gamer, what kind of game at which time of the year. And even when it comes to prices, we said, okay, so we need to go very low with the prices, very low with the margin, because the clients, we started the business in Poland and we knew that client in Poland cannot afford the game in the full price. It would be perfect world as publishers sometimes expect that everybody in the world will buy the game full price, SRP, standard retail price, but it doesn't work this way. And not only in gaming industry, in almost every industry, fashion, cosmetics, you name it, there are always off price. And we said, okay, so very low margin. To get very low margin, you need two things. One, you need to, to buy the game from the wholesaler or from the publisher in a good price. And then you have to keep the cost of the company very low, not to spend too much on OPEX, CAPEX, etc. to could handle this delicate balance between earnings, between revenue and cost and the profit which you have at the end of the day. And remember that we were bootstrap business, reinvesting everything, what we earned. So we kept the cost very low. We were traveling around the world, knowing literally every wholesaler, every seller of game games in the world, not only publishers, because publishers didn't want to talk to us, but the market, it's built in a way that we have publishers and then we have thousands of companies who are between publishers and the end user. So we have wholesalers, we have retailers, we have different kind of official sellers, we have different kind of business sellers who are just trading with the games and selling them. <coughs> and we visited every trade show in the world. We were trying to reach to any company who is selling the game and convince them to work with us. And of course, we wanted to work with publishers, but they didn't want to work with us. Even though at some point after three or four years, we were leader when it comes to World of Warcraft, the biggest title at that time by Blizzard, mm -hmm. an amazing game. Mm -hmm. And I was knocking the door to Blizzard saying so many times, hey, please talk to me. I would love to be your official partner. And they never wanted to talk. And we were very frustrated and we were very in a very difficult position to scale the business. And then we changed the business model to marketplace. And we say, okay, if the publishers doesn't want to give us an official agreement, then we change the business model for the marketplace. And then anybody who is following terms and conditions can sell the games. And I said, and there would come a day when big publishers would like to work with us because we will be big enough and they will recognize how good service we provide to the market. Mm. 
And actually it happened. So a couple of years later, when G2A was on the top of marketplaces, I got an email by LinkedIn and it was, hello, Mr. Bartosz, we see you. Maybe we should talk. And I said, yes, finally, <laughs> after so many years and hard work and pushing forward, it happened. Yeah. There is so many stories about, about mm-hmm. growing the business. And you said your costs were low and your margin was quite low. Like when were you, would you say that you were profitable in, in, in not just like barely breaking even, but when you started to make really good profits, how many years was that through? And was it the shift to making it into a marketplace, which really started to propel the business? G2A is a very profitable company. And we were profitable from the day one. We kept the cost so low, just at the very beginning, six people trading with games and one room. So you don't need too much things mm. because I give you a few examples to understand the mindset because it's not so easy to understand that. When we flew to, to, to the United States, with my business partner for the first time, we slept in one room in one bed because we didn't want to waste money for two rooms. I was driving the same car for 11 years. From the moment I set up G2A, 11 years, I was driving the same car until the moment when my people told me, hey boss, maybe you should change it. I said, oh, okay, good idea. Not because I don't like cars, I love them, but because I didn't want to waste any penny. I didn't want to waste money. We didn't have any dividend for over 10 years. And when I'm telling this to my colleagues from the United States, UK, Germany, other countries, and I say, yeah, G2A was profitable business and we didn't have any dividend. And they said, what do you mean? No dividend. I'm saying, No, every money was reinvested. So at the end of the year, we were always on the balance because every money we were earning, we were reinvesting in marketing, reinvesting in acquiring new clients, reinvesting in the product, which was our platform. So building better and better platform for buyers and sellers. And even when the company was really big, like 500 people, the office that we had many offices, we have office in the Netherlands. We had the office in Hong Kong. We had office, three offices in Poland. The largest R and D research and development office was in Poland. It's a great country because you have super high quality employees at the same time, very reasonable with the cost. But even though that was the fact, we didn't rent the A class building saying, yeah, We earn tons of money. Let's have A-class building. Perfect. No, we rent smaller building. And after that, we rent it for a super good price, industrial building. And we Mm. charge it cost, creating amazing office. Our Mm. friends from Facebook, from Google, from PayPal, they were coming to our office and saying, oh my God, it's like in Silicon Valley 20 years ago. What an amazing mm. office. You can see on YouTube many films on this, many videos, because we make it vibrant. We make this office really amazing at the same time, still keeping low cost. So that was our approach for so many years. And I think this is one of the things important at G2A that, that we are very respectful for human beings, for people, for money we spend. And you said about risk appetite. So we always look at the money two times before we spend it uh, because we want to do it very wisely. And Mm -hmm. of course, we made thousands of mistakes, but that's normal. That's the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. How how does your marketing work? How do you get to the gamers that they find out about G2A? What's your strategy now on being able to get bigger market share by getting the right marketing to the right people? 
how many hours we have. <laughs> okay. Uh, but uh, we have to understand that today G2A is significant business. It's not as big as the biggest companies in the world. And we are still humble to understand that and to try harder. At the same time, 30 million clients, 75,000 items on our platform. So the biggest selection of the offerings that you mentioned, working with over 1,000 influencers along the way, supporting hugely esports, etc. Today, G2A is, is a kind of conglomerate of so many people, partners, and markets. It's a very global company. The main market for us is the United States, but just behind them, we have Europe, all the biggest countries, and UK, Germany, France, Spain, Italy, etc. And we are in literally every country in the world with our clients. So when we talk about marketing, we talk about very advanced, matured, and mixed approach. Very omnichannel in the meaning that we try to reach to our clients on any channel which is there, on not only on our main platform, but through every social media, through different stages of the communication. And we mix many ingredients. Let me give you a few examples. We look at best sellers. So we look, what are the products, what are the games on the market that are best sellers in which category and which date? What are the releases which are coming? It's very different when it is Hell Divers or Call of Duty or maybe GTA, uh, GTA 5 or Zombies or something else. Hmm? We look at the current game releases, not only all-time favorite. So we look at Manor Lords, which now it's a great game. We look at Hellblade 2, Sensua Saga. And on this, we put two main revenue generation streams. So one is gaming, which I mentioned, and the other one is uh, non-gaming part of the business, which are software, gift cards, subscriptions, educational content, etc. And then we put on this the market. We have selected markets which are core for us, and we are very focused there, and we have very local approach. Example, today is Thursday, sorry, on Friday... Uh, 9, 10, 10 of the May in Spain, in Valencia, Drift Masters series has an amazing event on the one of the series on the championship level of Europe. And G2A is the main partner when it comes to this, um, to the series. And in several countries, Spain is the first, but then we have several others with the big final in Poland. We are reaching our clients, not only on the digital way, but also physical way. Yeah. So we are mixing approach with yeah. the markets, with the physical and digital, and with very different marketing strategies. Yeah. You can, this is a topic I can talk a lot because then we come to the brand awareness. So how mm. we position our company. And yeah. another example that I can give you was in Spain, one of our most important markets in Europe. So we created gate-ready communication platform. Mm. What does it mean? G2A stays for gate to adventure. G2A, gate okay. to adventure, to digital adventure. So we understand mm -hmm. it as opening the adventure for digital entertainment, for digital journey. And another thing which is important from the marketing perspective is how you position yourself when it comes to archetypes, when it comes to how you think about who you are for the client. So mm -hmm. it depends on the methodology. You have from eight to 25 different archetypes. So we mm -hmm. have chosen two of them. And we told to our clients, yes, we want to give you an amazing journey 
with care. So we are caregiver. So we take care about the client right. in right. this digital journey. At the same time, we want to give them adventure. That's another mm -hmm. archetype. So we are saying mm -hmm. with us, you can experience an amazing adventure in the digital world. Either that can be Netflix with the subscription mm -hmm. or it mm -hmm. can be game, which is dedicated for you and releasing this month and you can have it. So talking about the marketing is the conversation that can last hours and the approach. Mm -hmm. We work massively with influencers. We support them. We create content with them. Now, we also create and work with, with the sport people, with athletes. Several of them will be attending Olympic Games very soon, and we are supporting them with their desire to get the gold medal and, and so on. No, it, it, it sounds <laughs> like it, it's, it's fascinating to hear the complexities. And what I like about your approach is that it's multifaceted, that it, it is digital, social media. It is in person at these events. It is using influencers. It is, I, I think it's a really good example. It's also how our companies another are. example would be partnerships. So at the very beginning of the company, and when you are a startup, nobody wants to do the partnership with you. Mm -hmm. Later on, mm -hmm. when you are at the growth stage, you have to fight very hard to get good brands next to your brand. Yeah. And then later on, when you convince people and companies and brands that you are trustworthy, that they mm -hmm. can benefit working with you, it's like with us today. So we work with Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, with banks, with Burger King in Spain. We did campaign earlier this year, last year, with Dr. Edgar Pizza, a great example of the campaign. So we mm. created uh, discount codes which were put on 10 millions of pizza and sold to the clients in Poland. Huge yeah. success, great campaign. So this kind of activities... Also, yeah. we are running on daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. And long story. No, that's great. That's great. Moving on from marketing, because we probably could have a whole show just about the, yeah. the complexities of your marketing, but it's been absolutely fascinating hearing your different approaches. Um, how have you evolved as a leader? Hmm. Wonderful question, because I am still evolving. <laughs> And I believe it never ends. Let's start with the anecdote. When I finished my first university in Poland, that was the main technology university, and I finished it, and I finished it with the highest score in the history of the university. And I thought that, oh, I really know a lot. I read 500 books, I get great score, blah, blah, blah. And I got a proposition to set up my first business. It was very different industry. It was still construction. So I went for the first meeting. You can be the CEO. I need a partner to do it. So we can start the business, just two of us. I said, what industry? Steel constructions. I said, all right, sounds good. I know nothing about it. And when I started doing business, it appeared that everything they taught me at the university is quite far from the business reality. And mm -hmm. for the first three to six months, it was like uh, pumping your head with tons of information because mm -hmm. I was everybody in my company because the company was one person because my yeah, business yeah. partner wasn't there yet. And I thought that, oh, in five years, it will be much easier for me because I'd, I will be so much smarter. Watch this. Five years later... When I thought about this moment five years before, yeah. I was like, ooh, the life there was easy. Now it's difficult. But in five years, I will be smarter. So next five years, when I thought about the previous moment, was exactly the same story. And today is exactly the same story. I know that, ooh, my life 20 years ago as a business person, as an entrepreneur, CEO, ooh, with my knowledge today, there, oh, that would be a holiday. 
But I've got yeah. so so one of our one of my previous <laughs> guests called John Briggs. He said to me that being an entrepreneur, business owner is constantly evolving and changing. The way he said was, if you've never owned a company that 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 has a revenue or profit of a hundred thousand dollars, you don't know what it's like. You go to five hundred thousand dollars. You go to a million. You go to five million. You go to ten million. You go to a hundred million. At every stage, you're having to evolve with your business as well. Yeah. And where we loop back to right at the start about making quality decisions, you're always your every step that you make. You've never done it before. You've never experienced that type of business before. And I thought it was a really fascinating way to. And it sounds like you're supporting that idea that every step there's something a, a different decision or a different approach that you need to think about before you go to the next step what's your thoughts about that i think this is one of the most fascinating things about being an entrepreneur that at every stage of the business of course if the business is growing <clears throat> because it don't have to it doesn't have to it business can be in stagnation but i was lucky enough to run the businesses which were growing. And of course, we had hundreds of ups and downs. At the same time, there is few things when you ask me about evolving me as a leader, evolving me as an entrepreneur, few things. One, val values are not evolving. The values that I had 20 years ago, 10 years ago, are the same that I have today. The values about people, about trust, about respect, about appetite, about feedback, about growing. It's all the same. I don't believe the nature of human being is changing. The nature of human being can change, but 99% is the same. What is changing is the skill set, only if you are growing with your business or faster. Mm. So my appetite and also the people that I work with is really big. What I mean by that? When I finished my first university, I started the second one. So the first was tech and human. The second one was finance. And then I dreamed about Harvard and MIT, but I couldn't afford that. Just five years ago, I could afford that. So first thing I did was flying to Boston and attending the programs at MIT and Harvard and getting more. And the more I know, the more I know that I don't know. You ask me about the mindset and my mindset is getting more and more humble, I would say. Mm. Uh, because the more I know, the more books I read, the more trainings I did, I feel like there is so much more to learn. There is so much more to know. At the same time, things that I do are easier for me because my level of skills is growing. But at the same time, the challenges are bigger. Yeah. So it is constant evolution of you as a leader, and I think what keeps me rooted down to earth, if I may use this phrase, sure. is DNA, is something we call in G2A DNA, values. And yeah. this is what I said at the beginning, that, that culture are values and values are the secret sauce of creating and running the business. So... At the start of the conversation, you said that you've moved from CEO to chairman, president. Why did you make that change? It was mostly because after seven years of living in the Netherlands, partially for two years in Boston and Netherlands, and I got back to Poland. And now after seven years of, of living outside, Poland, because I was born in Poland and I lived here for several years. And several years ago, I moved to Amsterdam, to, to the Netherlands, and I was living there and traveling a lot around the world. And then I moved to Poland and the setup of the business is for me, the most proper one is with this function. Um, 
still you have to remember that being a founder of the business, that never changes. And you always think about what can be done better, who can be better talent to invite to the company, to bring on board. How can we navigate and help with the challenges the business have, etc. And still your working week is tough. It's closer to 100 hours than to 50 hours, <laughs> much closer, sometimes even more. And this is entrepreneurial life and mm. you have to like mm. it. If you don't like yeah. it, you will be suffering. So, so the decision is that you wanted to take, you, you wanted a different challenge by being the chairman rather than the CEO. You've explained to me that you'd never really, as a founder, you always... You know, remain wanting to grow the business and build the business yeah. but uh, and uh, was it a location reason why you took uh, the step the location yes that that was one of the reasons and at the same time i have great team people around me sure. so over the years i was blessed with people that joined me of course mm. i made many mistakes and there were several people who joined me and Eventually, we said, oh, okay, this is not the sure. same cup of tea. But the team that I have today is really good. And they give me a lot of comfort that, that G2A is going in the good direction. And of course, we have great ambitions in front of us. Mm. And so following on from that, what is the plan for the next two to five years for you and your business? I wanted to jump in there because I think it's an interesting question after you've, your last comments. One is what we build as a company, as a business, is the digital powerhouse, which we called is the largest marketplace for digital goods. And from each perspective, so product perspective, client perspective, platform perspective. We have so much thing we want to do. So if you could jump on our roadmap of how we want to develop the product of G2A, which is platform, because people sometimes don't recognize that the product of eBay are not the products on the, on the page. Product mm. of eBay is eBay platform. And mm. what is offered are just offerings, items, mm. things that you can buy. But the real platform, the real product is what you give to your customer. So in our case, this is G2A.com platform. And on our roadmap, you will see one, over 150 different features that are waiting to be implemented on our marketplace as soon, as fast as possible. So basically, mm -hmm. this is the one thing. Now, the other, we... We never stood with the ambition of the growth of the company. And there are a couple mm -hmm. of reasons. One, the higher you are, the more beautiful view you can see. So the mm -hmm. bigger is the business, the bigger company, the better partnerships you can do, the better mm -hmm. services for the client you can offer, mm -hmm. uh, the better geographic and coverage you can have. And the size is important. Of course, we can say, no, not really. We have niches, etc. But the size is important. At the end of the day, the bigger the company is, the easier it is to navigate many things. Most often you have more assets to do that. And that matters. At the same time, the size is not the aim, the size is not the aim. The, my, my dream, I can share that with you because that will define from where G2A is. Mm. When you are from Poland and you fly somewhere to the New York, to, to New York City or to Shanghai or to Hong Kong, and people are asking you, hey, where are you from? And you are saying from Poland. They always ask one question. What's that? From Holland? <laughs> and you're saying, no, come on, it's not happening. No, from Poland. Ah, Poland. Okay, okay. And 
I was wondering why is that the case? And in mm -hmm. my opinion, when I did the analysis, the reason is that there is no global brand rooted from Poland that started mm -hmm. from Poland. It's like with Sweden, mm -hmm. which without IKEA and Volvo, mm -hmm. there are two brands that are defining mm -hmm. where Sweden is on the geography map. It's an amazing mm -hmm. country. At the same time, without those two brands, and now we mm -hmm. have more Spotify or Klarna, etc. Yeah. But yeah. that was the beginning. Like with South Korea, mm -hmm. you have yeah. Kia and Samsung. That's it. Mm -hmm. And where is South Korea? And because you recognize, mm -hmm. you think Germany, then it depends. Audi, Mercedes, or BMW. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And, and so on. And you think Poland, and then it's, aha, okay. So my dream was to build a mainstream company which started from Poland and is fully global business. And that was our desire from the very beginning. We wanted to build a company that will be playing in the first league and will deliver a super good quality, a service to the customers and will be recognized by this. So that's the dream. And this is yeah. where we are heading. Amazing. What a great story. Thank you very much. Look, we're coming to the end of the interview. I ask the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. First one is, what's the best decision that you've made? That I agreed to build G2A. Starting the business, yeah? Yes, starting business. Because it could never happen. You sometimes you've got an opportunity and you have to say yes or no. And I said mm -hmm. yes. And that was the best decision because without this decision, there wouldn't be G2A. Yeah. What's the best piece of advice you've been given? I think be yourself, be authentic. Don't try to be someone else because you never be, but just mm. to be the best version of yourself. Amazing. Who's the person that's helped you most in your career? Hmm. Um, Tony Robbins. Oh. And I know that sounds crazy, but I grew with Tony Robbins, with his books, with his podcast, with his trainings. I was on several of the trainings of Tony Robbins. And in my deep belief, he's with me for the last 25 years. Yeah. So, so I, I think everyone who's done gone through a personal development journey goes through a Tony Robbins phase. I, I generally think everyone that's probably even an entrepreneur goes through a Tony Robbins phase because he's so impactful for people. And I went through a phase of listening to his podcast and reading his books. And he's a great inspiration for me and probably a lot of people around the world. Have you ever met him? Three times. But I never had a conversation like face oh, okay. to face. I was at his training, so I can say that, yeah, hey, he was like 20 centimeters from me, but I never right. had a lunch with him or I don't know. Okay. I, I cannot say I know him personally. Okay. Tell me about a regret that you have. Whew. I don't have regrets. I My approach is to always do the best I can. If it works, perfect. If it doesn't, okay, sorry. But I have no regrets because I really tried hard. And if I failed, okay, that was the situation. But I never, I never gave up. I never... What about relationships? Is there any sort of relationships which... That's often where regrets come up is that I wish I'd done that slightly differently or I wish I'd have maybe done that or that opportunity came around. I give you an example because I don't think I can regret something because even bad things and bad relationships, they are leading you to new places where you wouldn't be without those relationships. Sure. sure. So one of the examples that I had was in my previous business, the business was going very successful. After five years, 
we brought it to top 20 steel businesses in Poland and it was super business. But one day the guy came to me and he was from a big company. He proposed an agreement. He bought a lot of products from my company and he never paid. And at the moment when we were signing the contract, contract he already knew that he is doing, he is going to do bankruptcy. And he basically stolen from me. He basically tricked me. And I can say, oh, I have a regret because this person cheated me. And then I wasn't smart enough to say no. But at the same time, thanks to this, I had so many difficulties. I have so many difficult moments. I had the biggest down in my life when it comes to business. And again, thanks to this, I grew as an entrepreneur, becoming stronger than ever before. So yeah. can I say that I regret this situation? No, I never forgive. This person name is Mirek Tindel and he is on my list. Yeah, he's waiting for giving me the money back that he stole from me. And the day will come when he will give me the money back. So I never forget. That's another thing. But right. at the same time, I am not regretting what happened mm. because mm. it happened and mm. I took everything I could out of it, yeah. becoming yeah. somebody who I am today. And probably mm. without this lesson, there would never yeah. be G2A yeah. because I would be yeah. still in that, in, in that business. Yeah. So I don't have regrets like this. Okay. Okay, cool. Uh, what are you most the best I can, and I think this is my shield against regrets. Yeah. Okay. Great. What are you most proud of? Hmm. Oof. There's many things I am proud of. I am proud of. I could split it in two: my private life and my business life. Mm -hmm. And there is. There are always people that I am proud of. I am super proud with my mom. I am super proud with my brother. I am proud with my family. And I am proud with my g 2 with the company and culture we created together. I am proud with the executive team, which is there. So these are my prouds. These are my, my, my bright spots that when I think about mm -hmm. it, I'm saying, yeah, yeah, this is something amazing, amazing. in my life. Right. Why do you do what you do? The appetite. <laughs> I am a dreamer. I always was. When I was a boy and I had 10 years, I knew what kind of car I want to have. When mm. I was 15, I already knew that I want to run the business. And I was dreaming about it. Mm. And it never ends. I am still a dreamer. I still have a lot of things on my list. And that gives me the engine that gives mm. me the power to move on and to fight with the challenges every day. Amazing. What does legacy mean to you? Something that I am building, but it's far from be done. There's so much more to do. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you or find out more about, about G2A? Uh, LinkedIn. Me personally, LinkedIn. Bartosz Skwarczek or Bartosz Skwarczek. And G2A, you can find on every social media, just jumping to G2A.com. And we will be there. Happy to see you. Amazing. Look, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. I feel I've I, I feel I've really connected with you. You've had, you've got, and what I loved about this interview is the number of stories that have come out of it uh, that you've shared with my audience and with me. So thank you so much for your time and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. It was my Cheers. real great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really hope you've enjoyed that content. It's a really fascinating interview that I've done there. So please do, if you are enjoying this content, please do give it a like. Uh, please do give a subscribe. It'd be really good to boost the subscriptions. It really makes a difference to the algorithm in YouTube. So thank you for that. If you do hit subscribe, hit the bell icon and you'll get all of the content. You'll get notified when all of the content is available. Thank you so much for your time. It's really appreciated. Thanks a lot.